I went to interview this small business owner and he brought me into his office and he closed the door and he locked the door and he stripped to his underwear. I didn't want him to think I would be rattled. So I took out my reporter's notebook and I interviewed him in his underwear. The customer who you wanted to end that dinner and say, I've got to go, because you didn't want to be propositioned. All those cycles that we could have been doing something else. This narrative of the powerful man making unwanted advances played out over and over again, and very publicly, as dozens of women came forward accusing the Oscar-winning producer Harvey Weinstein of sexual harassment. Ten days after the story broke, American actress Alyssa Milano posted what might be called the tweet that started the hashtag MeToo. In the US, the MeToo movement went on to spawn the launch of Time's Up, which as a campaign has amassed over $21 million in donations intended to support victims of workplace harassment. In the best of circumstances, victims feel emboldened to expose those in power who have abused it while spurring more and more women to pick up the mantle and pursue public office. I'm gonna fight and work on legislation that helps women come out of the shadows. With a judge who made a crack about my looks on my very first day in court. To honor the victims who came forward, Time Magazine named the Silence Breakers as the person of the year. We started looking at this, and even before some of the most high profile cases, and it just was clear to us that this is where we needed to land. The reason there's been this outpouring isn't because every woman has been sexually assaulted at work. Women are frustrated because they all know about all of the elements that go into that environment that at their extreme enable sexual harassment. It's a phenomenon unlike anything else. This is going to be uncomfortable. That's when the power shifts when men start to think, oh. The coverage around the movement from October 2017 onwards might suggest that the world of Hollywood, and media more generally, is especially dangerous for working women. It may be here where some of the most widely covered and disturbing accounts of abuse originated, but is it also here where these stories end? I do think that it does happen in the entertainment industry and in the television-centric piece of media. There's an issue in that we have male leaders for almost all of our major media outlets. I don't think we have any reason to think that there's any less of what we've seen in the media business on Wall Street, in restaurants and service companies and factory floors around the world. No reason to think it's, it's any different. We have recently carried out a three-country survey, the US, the UK, and Mexico, on young men and their views about manhood and which men harass. So these are young men ages 18 to 30. About one in five to one in three young men had carried out some form of harassment online or real life in the last month. How does this play out? Within the context of the workplace, Barker views sexual harassment as strongly reflective of the wider imbalance existing between male and female employees. As such, combating and ultimately eliminating workplace harassment means addressing the larger office culture of gender inequality. I have a daughter who's just entered the tech industry, and uh, she told me the other day, she said, you know, Mom, when I'm at work and I hear inappropriate jokes, I don't laugh. I thought to myself first, I always laughed. I thought I had to. It just makes me emotional to think about it because she's not laughing because she said she learned it from me. It's not this single problem that we can somehow pluck out of and say we're gonna address it by itself. In meetings, which I often call the killing fields of a woman's career, if women make up less than one third of the group, their voices are almost not heard. And I think every woman has had that experience where she has said something, she's had an idea, and there's crickets. It's not the HR department hires someone to give the 45 minute PowerPoint. It is what we do overall in the workplace to make it safe, supportive, of women's participation at all levels. And then two minutes later, a guy says exactly the same thing, and suddenly everybody's like, oh my god, Bob is a genius. The same thing with interruptions. Women are interrupted three times more frequently than men. So that means leave policies, and quotas if we have to on our boards, and hiring policies. It's not a pipeline issue. Think about this. Women, particularly in the United States, have been getting more than half of college 
degrees for the past 30 years. The average CEO is in his mid-50s at this point. If it was a pipeline issue, more than half of CEOs would be female. There are things that individual women can do, but I think whether there's been some articles in the Harvard Business Review and elsewhere, it's not fair to say women are responsible for the patriarchy that exists in the workplace. We've got to get men feeling comfortable to say we have something to do here. Support the woman who brings up a case. Back her up. Talk to other men about it. If you're there when it happens, speak up. We know why men don't do this, because we're afraid. We're afraid it's going to come toward us. We're afraid, what, what is it going to look like when we're trying to climb in a firm? But we've got to get men to speak up, not instead of women, but supporting women. On March the 8th, 2018, five months after the Weinstein story first made headlines, the world celebrated International Women's Day. In Spain, some five million women went on strike. In Pakistan, citizens marched, demanding for gender equality and an end to violence against women. Though there was certainly a heightened sense of fervor, from Afghanistan to the Philippines, where women emboldened by Me Too and Time's Up took to the streets, the question remains, is this simply a moment or a movement? The, the things that we're talking about now, we called it going to work back in the 80s, right? It was just the way life was. And then Anita Hill came along and everybody thought the world would change for good. There's work to be done still. We've had these moments before, right? So this one feels particularly big. And we have social media in ways that we didn't 20 years ago when, say, Anita Hill was calling Clarence Thomas out. Let this not just be this blip that we all reacted to. I think we're in the middle of the beginning of this change. The question to me is not whether it's a movement, it's how long the movement will last, how durable it is, how deep it will go. But I don't have any doubts that we have a long, long way to go. It is about calling individual men out. And I think a lot of the focus has been on that. So please keep making the lists and holding men accountable with due process, that needs to be said too. But let's acknowledge that it's going further upstream. It's about women's empowerment in general, not just sexual harassment. It's changing. It's changing slowly, but it's changing. <laughs>